those of you who don't know me, I guess most of you don't, my name is Sean. I'm a principal product manager, product unit manager actually from Huawei. And uh, you're going to be stick with me for some time this afternoon. And I'll tell you something about our AI stuff, on device AI stuff. And hopefully, towards the uh, the second half of the session, I will actually do some real-time coding, and hopefully the demo god is with me, and that can work. If that doesn't work, I also have a backup plan, play some videos, but I really hope it will work. And uh, so, first off, let's do some poll. Uh, who of you guys are developers here? Please raise your hand. Okay. I see, like, 45%. So who of you guys are not developers? Man, this works every time. You see, this really works every time. You, you ask a, a room full of audience, well, it, it's not full here because it's such a big room. You ask, you ask them, like, who are the developers? Some of you guys raise your hand, and then you ask who are not developers, and the other half didn't. So that means we have some guys here in this room that's not in a binary state, it's in the middle. You guys who didn't raise your hand, in both of the times, you're not developers, at the same time are developers. So who are you? <laughs> so let's try it again, huh? So who are not developers here? I see one girl, I know her. So three guys, four, five? Okay, the camera guys. Um, who are developers? I think, I think we're reaching like 97%. I, I still think there are one or two or three guys who didn't raise his hand at the both times. But anyways, just, just a quick info here. This is called, in a behavioral economy, it's called the default option phenomena, which means that most people stick with the default option because default option here is not raising your hand. Now, surprisingly, this also fits the description of physics, because in physics, there's this law called lower energy state. Everything in the universe tries to stay at the lower energy. And here, in this case, not raising your hand is saving energy. As you can see, all these laws in physics and, and economies, it just works together in this situation. It's really amazing. Every time I try, try this, every time it works. But anyhow, let's get started. So he, I'm here to talk about like our AI stuff. So like I said, two sessions. Let's just get started with the first session. So you probably have been through some of our talks, or at least some intros or something on our stage. So basically, one of the major, major features of the new Huawei devices coming from last year, end of last year and this year, namely the P20 series and the Mate 10 series, we actually put a chip on our phone. That chip is called MPU. MPU stands for Neural Processing Unit, which means that that chip processes new neural network on the device without any help of the cloud. And this means that you can put a lot of AI stuff now on the device for two reasons. Number one is that it's faster and more power efficient because now you don't have to send a bunch of stuff into the cloud. This actually is, is very useful in some scenarios like the Prisma guys who's going to come later on the stage to talk about their stuff. Imagine you have to send a big picture into the cloud to do the inference, then come back. That takes time because network is, is not always stable. So that's the first reason. It, it's, it's, it's performant yet power saving. It's, it's, it, it, it performs much faster. I can see, show you some metrics later. It performs much faster, but, but, but uses much less energy than the CPU. And uh, the, the second reason being that sometimes you have to really think about the privacy of your users. And sometimes the stuff they give you, they do not necessarily want to share with the rest of the world, meaning that you want to process these stuff on your device without having to connect to the network, without having to send it to the cloud. So for these two reasons, you want to use the on-device AI. And maybe there are some other reasons as well. But I think these are basically two of the major reasons. Now, we have seen some trend in the past couple of years, actually 
namely this year and last year, you know, AI stuff are coming to the, to the device. Now, I, we have, I have actually uh, collected these couple of articles, and uh, they are from three Jeffs from different companies, but, but apparently, you know, you know, after the fact, it seems like successful guys tend to name themselves Jeff. So if you want to be more successful, maybe you should change, thinking about change your name to Jeff. But anyhow, the first Jeff from, from Apple says that the smartphone will get even smarter with on-device machine learning. Of course, Apple has their agenda because they are not particularly strong on the cloud, so they want everything to be on device. But anyhow, I think this is true, though. The second Jeff from Qualcomm said that on device processing and AI goes hand in hand. Of course, if a lot of AIs are moving on the, on the, on the, on the, you know, on the device, then you do more processing on the device, which is good for their business because they're Qualcomm, they make chips, right? And the third guy, Google, Jeff Dean. I think most people should be familiar with Jeff Dean, or at least know about this guy. He's an amazing guy. Um, he said 80% of the smartphone will have on-device AI capabilities by 2022, which I think is going to be true. We'll see. I mean, it's 2018, so there's four years more to go. But anyhow, as you can see, there are, um, there are these trends that AI processing or AI inferencing, for that matter, is going more, more and more towards the device, right? So that's the trend there. Now, let's talk about our, our MPU. As you can see here, we have some benchmarks. This is done by our own lab. But in all fairness, we have 25 times more performance than if you would do the same thing on the CPU in terms of doing the AI inferencing with neural networks. And yet, it's power efficient, 50 times more power efficient than the CPU. And if you want to talk about the specific numbers, here's some benchmark we did with ResNet 50. Um, we can do 2,005 image inference per minute, while if you do that on, on, on the iPhone, particularly iPhone X, you can do like 880 per minute. And then, you know, everything from there goes down the hill. And if you do, do it with the Galaxy S7, S8, I don't think they, they have GPUs, but I could be wrong. But anyhow, it, it does 95. So you can see the comparison there. And these are other networks that, that you know, we, we did b benchmarks on. But anyhow, I want to actually have another quick poll. Don't worry, it's not a trap anymore. So who of you guys are familiar, at least familiar with AI or machine learning and know the basic concepts? And you know about ResNets, and 50s and 120s and, and, and Inceptions and, and VGG networks. So some of you guys know, but anyhow, it, so for those of you who don't know, these are just different AI models. They're mostly trained for image recognition. They have different architectures and, and have different depths, if you will. If you compare like ResNet 50 to ResNet 152, it just basically how complex they are, 50 versus 152, if it's under the same name like ResNet here. But anyhow, it's just different AI models that can do the image inference. And, and, and the, of course, the amount of computation in that model are different. So here are some benchmarks for these models. But if you go down to the basics, why that MPU is faster than, than GPU and than CPU is because, you know, our traditional architecture on CPU, if you think of it as, as a table, a lot of unit or a lot of surface errors are occupied by the control unit. That, that is what CPU is good at. It, it's good at logic controls. And it has a lot of, like, you know, units that does the, you know, does the computation, you know, arithmetic computation, but, but it's probably like 50%, 60% of, of the size is being used for that. But if you move on to, on, to, on to GPU, it has a lot more computation unit. It has a lot less controlling unit. It's because GPU is traditionally you know, good at processing image. And a lot of times, you can process image in parallel. And that's why GPU is good at processing 
you know, actually vectors, basically. So now the MPU is good at or designed to process tensors, which means that tensors being the multi-dimensional matrix or arrays, if you will. So that's why MPU is faster because it's just good at processing these multi-dimensional arrays or, or, or we call them tensor, which is the building blocks or cornerstone of the neural networks, which is basically, if you will, it equals to the neural network equals to deep learning, which is where the, the, the AI has been advancing in the past past couple of years really quickly. So that's why we, we can process and directly process tensors and a lot in that way a lot faster than GPU than CPU. So that's the secret of it being faster than GPU and CPU, hence the you know hence the metrics before. So that's a little bit why. Um, since a lot of you guys here don't my slide is stuck. I don't know why. Okay, now it works. This is probably why I left Microsoft because sometimes Windows just gives you all these problems and, and a restart would work, but I don't want to restart my computer here. I kind of want to skip these slides because this is a bit more like details since a lot of you guys don't know a lot about AIs here. But this slide basically says that how we, how we actually run the model, we don't, we don't actually load the model and, 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 and then compile on the fly, like jet compiler, whatnot, and run it. We actually compile to machine code and directly run it. Hence, we, we can run it faster, but that also means that we will have this like preparing step where you actually have to, have to convert your model, like your model from TensorFlow or, 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 or CAFE into our format or our machine code. So there's this little step needed, but, but don't worry, we'll talk about that later with our demos and in our two, we will show you how you can easily do that with just a drag and drop. Now, talking about neural networks, you have to know that it's basically a, 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 a cluster of computations. And in that cluster of computations, you have basically different layers. It's just like our neurons, you have layers. And in these layers, you have different operators to take care of different kind of computations, convolutions and, and, and whatnot, concat and whatnot. But we have a comprehensive list here tells you that these are the neural network uh, operators that we support at the moment. Notice the at moment, because we're gonna add more support gradually, even though this is already the, the biggest list on the market today. If you look at CoreML, uh, supported um, operators, Carmel being the, the Apple's, uh, you know, device on device AI framework. Uh, they support 60 some 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 uh, operators and, and Android NN from Google supports I think 30 some operators. So we have a pretty comprehensive list here. Now you might ask like, what if I don't have something that's not on this list? What if I train a model that's a little bit more complex than than you have thought and, 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 and it has like operators not on the list. That's okay because we will have tools to support that. Again, we can demo that later. But just to wrap it up, it's faster, it saves energy, and we support a lot of different frameworks and a lot of neural network operators are already supported but we're adding more support. Last but not least, the integration part the part where you are actually gonna get down to the business, you're gonna get your hands dirty to integrate your own model, will have tooling support, which makes it much, much easier. And we will actually show that later in the demo. Uh, I'll do some coding if the demo god is with me. But anyhow, we just wanna share a little bit how the Prisma guys did it. Um, those, for those who don't know about Prisma, they, they are a, a wonderful app. I think this is the first AI-capable app I have ever remembered. 
uh, in the market, I think it was a couple of years ago, uh, you guys first published on, on the iPhone, and they can do this style transfers. Basically, you take a, take a picture, then it transfers to entire different style, like impressionist, and what, what you have basically make the, make the photo really look stunning in a special way. But anyhow, they use AI, and now their AI processing is on the device, uh, our, our, um, you know, our mobile phones. And, and our friend from Prisma will just tell you a little bit about how they did it from a developer perspective, what kind of you know, do's and don'ts and, and what kind of stuff you have to be careful about. Then after that, I'm actually going to show a real demo on my device and actually show how you could do such, a, such, a, such an app with our framework support and with our tooling support. So without further ado. <clears throat> Is it working? Oh, good. Thanks, Sean, for introduction. Let me uh, get a little introduction about myself. My name is Maxim. Uh, I am developer in Prisma, and I'm doing research on how accelerate AI on Android phones. And I'm working in Prisma. Prisma is a company that uh, doing AI photo improvement, and we got a B2C and B2B direction. On B2C, this is uh, this application. So. Uh, on B2B, we provide uh, SDKs and technologies to use on Android device, such as style transfer, segmentation, and uh, single recognition that helps you to use semantic information from image to improve it. Uh, so we got on Android uh, platform some awards from Google. Maybe no, maybe not. Uh, so we used uh, DDK on Prisma, and logically it uh, contains on one single library uh, that uh, provides GNI layer, and uh, for this and uh, so on, I will provide uh, some code listenings uh, to just understand what uh, uh, comes from Java side and what we need to perform some operations. So this model logically contains initialization phase and processing phase. Um, installation phase uh, contains maintains of uh, HI manager and HI environment, uh, such as model installation, model loading, and unloading to keep uh, memory in consistent state. So, as you can see, for loading, uh, we just need, uh, for example, for loading from assets, asset manager, and just a model name. On unloading, we just need a model name. And so if model manager is not in initialized anymore, uh, or maybe uh, don't, don't from first start, we just create it. So uh, processing phase itself contains some three steps. It's just uh, pre-processing data, uh, doing forward inference itself, and post-processing. Uh, we just need a float buffer, float array buffer that contains image information and uh, such things as width height, um, and that's all. Uh, so uh, we are accelerated uh, style transfer. So we just uh, need to know input width and height uh, as is uh, just image to image transformation. Uh, so on pre-processing and on post-processing, there is one uh, thing to think about it. So uh, on Android, Android native format uh, is interleaved on Android bitmap, for example. So for example, RGBA 8888 is, contains pixels in layout like RGBA, RGBA, and something like that. And uh, HI works on planner. Uh, on uh, planar memory layout, so you got uh, f for first uh, values for R channel, then for G channel, and so on. So we need to transform this and maybe apply so mean normalization for this. Uh, we used uh, Intel MKL for parallel processing of this, but uh, you can use any arbitrary uh, parallel processing library such as OpenMP includes it on Android. This doesn't matter. So post-processing is uh, just the same thing, but vice versa. You convert from planner channel that the output of HI and to interleave it fashion to display that and convert to bitmap to do everything you want. Uh, forward difference is just contains of uh, initialization buffer step 
initialization tensors. So we allocate tensors and copy from input float buffer to this tensor via mem copy and just run it and that's all. So uh, we use the style transfer models for our acceleration and I got some tips for tuning. Uh, for example, convolutions does really, really great. So even compared with iPhone. Uh, but to reduce a uh, chance to be uh, bound by memory bandwidth and do not uh, make some bottleneck on memory, uh, this requirement or tip to reduce copying operations. Uh, so, and uh, about upsampling, this upsampling layer is uh, absent in Kafi, but you can use a fork of Kafi that contains interplayer that uh, do the same, uh, or emulate upsampling via deconvolution. That's what you want. Uh, so we tested a, a 800x800 style transfer model on Huawei Mate 10 Pro, and. Um, the, we take a uh, cell transfer model that we run on CPU about a second and just uh, try to run this model on uh, NPU and already got the X2 speed up. So this, after some model tuning, we increase the speed up up to three times. So our, this model performs about 300 milliseconds compared to one second on CPU version. So a quick uh, results of this, uh, we got our model runs on our Prisma application. It's about three times faster on Huawei devices that uh, supports TTK. And it was pretty easy to integrate. Uh, it's pretty easy and uh, to use API provided by Huawei and DTK. And so, and uh, you can anytime uh, contact Huawei to support this, and we will answer. So, thank you, Sean. Thanks. So, as we can see, it would take some time for to integrate your AI models into the app, but that was actually last year because these guys started early and they didn't have much of tooling support. But now it's a lot better situation. We have tooling support. We do a lot of stuff automatically for you, so you can actually just focus on your business logic, writing your app's logic, rather than focusing on, oh, how do I do this? How do I, um, you know, how do I actually integrate a model when I have a model? Um, so right now, I'm actually going to talk to you about some of these tooling support we have. Then we'll see a demo. But before that, I just want to show you this. And if you look at the right side, or actually left side, um, this is, was 8.30 at night. I took a picture. It's somewhere South China, Shenzhen, next to Hong Kong. As you can see, a lot of things are overexposed. That's a typical situation. Like you, you go out at night, you want to take some good pictures, you take out your phone, doesn't matter if it's iPhone or iPhone X, doesn't matter, it's, it's Android phone, the highest you can get from, from Samsung, the S9, I believe, or S9 Plus. You see this kind of situation. That you're like, what can I do? You can do nothing. But at the same time, exactly the same time, I took that picture with my Huawei P20 Pro. As you can see, it's a lot better. A lot of things are not overexposed. This is not just a single shot with the camera. It actually uses the camera to take multiple shots and using AI to determine how to stitch them together under different exposures so that the right things are exposed with the right amount of exposure. And then you have this kind of photo where things just how they're supposed to look like maybe a little bit more enhanced than your naked eye, but it's certainly better than the ones that actually has a lot of overexposure. This is the kind of one of the examples how we put AI together onto our devices to make basically the user experience better. You could think a lot of different scenarios, different cases, you can use AI to, to improve your own app's experience, improve your user experience. This is just one of the examples. Now, you have probably heard something from us yesterday, how we have all these amazing APIs. 
that basically with AI trained model behind it, or today how you can actually integrate your own AI models into our apps on our platform, and you probably think, oh, this is cool. I mean, I almost used S word, but anyhow, and it's recorded. So, oh, this is cool. And, and, but how do I use it, right? Because you always hear about this, these amazing stuff, but when you get down to the business, when you want to get your whole hands dirty, you feel like helpless because it's a great promise, but you cannot implement it. So you're probably, you know, you, your inner self is probably like this now, like, oh, this stuff is great, but, uh, but where are the tools? How do I use it? What, where is the documentation, samples? And, 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 oh, you talk about AI models. How do I convert my own model from TensorFlow and Cafe or any other framework onto your platform? And, and oh, you talk about operators, but the, what, what operators are supported, what are not? And what are the, you know, the things that I should pay attention to? Or, or, be, or even better, can you tell me like, if my model just works or not? Or if it doesn't work, how can I improve it? How can I fix it? So these are the kind of things we do with our tooling support. Basically, we call it ID, but what actually it is, is it's Android Studio plugin, because we've done a study, we figured that everybody is using Android Studio to develop Android apps now, and we shouldn't build yet another, you know, IDEs or whatever the stuff is. We should just, you know, stand on the shoulder of the giant. Basically, then we build this, a plugin on top of Android Studio, we're going to continue putting a lot more other developer tooling support into this tool so that not only AI and many other aspects or the platform aspects of, of, of Huawei Mobile, you can use that with our tool and hopefully that will make your developer life a lot easier. So, like I said, it's, it's Android Studio plugin and it's supported both on, on Mac and, and, and Windows because Again, we did a study. We figured that even though you guys are Android developers, you, you don't feel ashamed to use Macs, right? I see Macs here and there. But I mean, we just want to use the best tooling. So we supported Android, uh, supported Mac OS, supported Windows. And uh, most of UI stuff is drag and drop. So you, you just do this drag and drop and then fix a few things here and there, mostly because there are this one last mile where business logic should work with the code, and, and we have no way of guessing or inferring that. It doesn't matter what kind of AI we have. So you still have to do the one last mile, but a lot of things are done automatically for you behind the scenes. And we also have a uh, lab. I believe we deployed quite some machines here in Europe lab so that you can use our ID to remotely connect to our device from the cloud as if you're just integrate, uh, you're you're just you know. Sorry, you're just working with it on your desktop, and you can also remote ADB into that, basically pushing your app into that device and debug remotely. And uh, we also have this high key 970 board, which is basically an embedded device. Uh, it, so it runs Android and, and other flavor of Linux as well. So you can use that to develop your solutions for embedded scenarios. And we also support that with our IDE. Basically, once you plug it in and we'll just install the drivers for you, automatically connect that and project the screen onto your desktop and, and, uh, and everything. So when we talk about models, like I said, the AI Foundation basically needs your model to work because you're, you know your business logic better, you know your scenarios better, you probably have the kind of data a, a generic AI model trainer or AI team doesn't have, so you want to train your own model. But once you have that mo AI model of yourself, you, you're going to want to import that onto our, uh, into your APK and onto our platform, and we have that as well. Basically, it's still a drag and drop experience. When your model is supported, everything goes through smoothly. We basically put in all the SO libraries and C++ code and JI encapsulations and, and, and Java API references for you automatically. So that at the end of the day, you just need one line of code to reference your model to do the inference or prediction, if you will. And uh, if your model had some of the compatibility issues, like I said earlier, if you use some of operators we don't support at the moment, it will actually tell you that, oh, here are, is your model. It has this and this layers. and, and these are supported, these are not, and uh, for these are not, why they're not supported here, 
might be the suggestion that you want to, how, or how you want to replace that layer and do the ring training and come back to integrate it. And we also have this, it's very primitive, but still we are trying to build that within the next couple of months, basically AI model store where we share more AI models with, with the community and, and basically you can use that as well. If you don't have your own model, but still you want to try the, the shared model, because there are basically three things. Um, we have our own APIs, which is the AI engine. These are the models that we train ourselves. We just encapsulate that into the API. Then you can basically directly use that if that fits your needs. If you already have some AI model, or if you have some very specific particular business scenarios, you can address the best with your own AI models. Then you train that model, and you can use our foundation layer to, to, to import that into the app and have that working. And uh, the third way would be that try to figure out if there's you know, shared model out there in the community and, and you can also use that. So this is one of the, you know, this is the third way basically using the AI model store. So the entire process of, of how you work with these, of course, starts from downloading something. I mean, it always starts from there. You download our plugin and install it and then here's the part where you decide whether you need, you have your own model or whether you want to use our own API. So if you want to use our API, you go the top route. Basically, you use our tool uh, for the engines, uh, high ID engine tools. Basically, then you just drag and drop some of the APIs we have. Or otherwise, if you have your own model, you use the tool like at the bottom to, to integrate. And then once you have coded up your app, you have that APK, you might want to test it. The way you test, of course, is using a real device. There's no better than a real device. And you, you use one of the Huawei, mod, uh, Huawei uh, devices, but you can use also the remote devices we provided for free, as long as you register yourself there, and you can get it for free, and you can do the testing over there through the, the, you know, the remote devices. So that's another way. If you're working with, with the high key 970, which also has AI capabilities, you can also use our tool to connect to that and, and, and try, to, try to test and debug it. And once you've you, you, you gone through that, you still need some testing, of course. We also have a comprehensive uh, testing service in our lab. I believe it's starting to be offered in Europe where you can do performance testing and, and, and functional testing. And if you do games, there are very specific gaming testing and a lot of different testings. So you can do that, and, and when you finish that, you can publish your app into our app gallery. So basically, that's end-to-end, -end, uh, you know, walkthrough of how you would use our toolings. And like I said, if you use the engine part, which is basically using our AI APIs, you can just directly do drag and drop, and hopefully you can be done within like under an hour, from half an hour to an hour, and then integrate that into your, 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 your app. So again, we do a lot of things automatically. So you just have to find the right API here and drag and drop to your, your code lines or between your code lines. And we do actually three things for you automatically. So first off, if you look at the middle piece, the code would be actually generated in the place you, you drop that API icon in. And second thing is that if you look at the top, whenever you use some APIs, you have to do the imports, right? But we, in this case, we actually automatically put the import code there on the top, so you don't have to move your fingers above. And the third thing is that our solution is basically a AR package-based solution, which means that you actually have to you know, write this one line of code in the Grido script to import that AR and sync it. But we do that automatically for you as well, so that you only have to drag and drop, then all these three things will be there. Of course, at this point, Android will ask you if you want to synchronize the Grado packages. You just click yes, and the package will be automatically downloaded for you. Now, you might be wondering where is documentation, right? Because always, when you look at the API, the API itself is not enough. And we have documentation there. It's just within the, within the tool, within the IDE. You click that API, you will see, okay, here's the documentation. Here is actually what's the input, basically. In this case, it's, it's, a, it's API. I think we demo yesterday, basically tells you 
trained by uh, trained with a lot of pictures. By the way, uh, tell you how 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 beautiful you feel oh, this picture is. Not the content in the beautiful, uh, not in the content in, in the image, but the overall settings and lightings and everything. So the, in this case, if you look at the right side, the documentation is actually telling you its input is the image, output is some flow scores from zero to 100. And then there is a sample code down there. You can also drag and drop these guys to the corresponding places. So this is how you would integrate a, an AI API, or AI engine API, if you will. And now the foundation part, basically the part I talked about where you have to integrate your models into the app. Still, it's a drag and drop experience. And, and we do the model analysis for you first. If the layers or the, 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 the operators in your model basically are compatible with what we support with everything on that list I showed you earlier, then you will be able to convert the model and integrate it into the right places. But in case you have some operators that you have that's not on the compatibility list, we'll actually show you a, a report says, OK, here's the, the list of the layers or operators you have, and these are the ones that's not supported. But that's how you use the foundation tool to integrate your, your, your model. This is the report, basically. Again, I'll show you later in the real demo. And uh, this is the remote device part where you can directly access from within our plugin on Android Studio. You just have to click the connect part, and then you will be shown with a login page. You log in there, and then you can basically remote access these devices. You can interact with them, just like an emulator. And you can also uh, click the debug button there, up on the right side on Android Studio. Now, your ADB device list will have one more device, which is this guy. We, we connect this through remote ADB so that you can actually push your app and debug it remotely. And this is the AI model store I told you about. But I'm not going to go more details on that. So now I'm going to show you a little demo and show you how I actually use our stuff to code it. So the demo here is it's simple, but not very simple. But so, so here is what I want to do. I want to be able to just type in a name. And then I want to find this guy. Basically, I use Bill Gates' example. I want to find Bill Gates, how old he is. I want to get a picture of his. Because I want to do this. I want to get that picture and use one of the model uh, that's shared by the community. It's called AgeNet. This, um, this AI model can determine from a picture how old a person is in that picture. Basically, it will give you a, 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 a age range. So then they can compare that inference from that AI model with the real age of Bill Gates and see if, if my, you know, my prediction is close. Then I'm going to, because normally on the search engine, these would be the kind of picture that's, that's shown at the thumbnail size. So they are actually relatively lower resolution. And, and then I can use our AI engine API to blow it up to make it, make it clearer, which is the part at the bottom, if you look at. And uh, that would need one of our API to, 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 to basically do. And so I can use that. So basically, I used our foundation, my own trained model. Uh, I also used our AI engine API. So that's the purpose of it. Of course, I use a search engine to basically search the name plus age, then I get the result on the right side. And I use the app to pull the image and the taxi and do the rest. So I'm just going to show you how this app works and, and, and show how you can use our API to do that. Oh, by the way, we have this wonderful app that's companion for our devices. It's called High Suite. I believe there is English version, international version. So all you have to do is basically install this guy and plug in your Huawei device. It actually projects the screen of the device onto your desktop. So I don't need all these. If you remember yesterday, there was this kind of projection light and a camera on it. So this is basically what's happening on my screen. 
So I can pull up this app I said, and uh, so, oh, I already used it, so Bill Gates is here. I don't know if you can see the difference or not, but the picture at the bottom is enhanced, so it's clearer than the one on the top. I can see that on my phone, but I don't know at this resolution on the projector if you can see it or not. But those of you who don't believe me, you can come here to see it later. So let me try something else, uh, or somebody else. I might want to try Elon Musk. Let's hope the Wi-Fi works. Yeah, I haven't really adopted to Google yet, so it's using another search engine, so it takes some time to get the image from there. And, uh, but anyhow, here you can see that the actual age of Elon Musk is 46. Here from this picture, from this particular picture, we use our AI model, the age net, to infer that this picture, this guy in the picture looks like it, he's between 25 and 32 with 90 point for 6% of, 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 uh, of, of probability. And um, it's mostly because two things. Those pictures you get from search engine, they're not necessarily the picture from this year. They could be from before. So there will be some error margins there. Another thing is that, in case you don't know, a guy like Elon Musk, he has his own stylist. So, you know, he might look younger with all the work that has been done by the stylist on him. So maybe let me just go back to Bill Gates. I say go. Again, network latencies. Yeah, it's a bit better with Bill Gates. His actual age is 62, and this one infers that he's between 48 and 55, with relatively high probability, 80-some percent. And uh, yeah, that's basically how the, what the app does. So right now, I'm going to show you how we can code such an app. Of course, I'm not going to start from scratch in that I, I have a, a, some basics like in the UI and, and the image placeholders and, and the buttons and whatnot. I just want to show you the part how we integrate the, the model, the, my own HNET AI model and how we use that AI, high AI engine API to, to basically enhance the image. So now I have this model already downloaded on my disk here. This guy, it's a cafe model. Now all I have to do, I just try to do it again. So once you install our plugin, you will see it here. Dev Eco, that's our tooling branding. We're still working through the brandings. And uh, now you see the engine part, like I said, the high engine part is the part you directly use in API from us. There are, of course, trained AI models behind it. And then there's this high foundation, which is the part I talked earlier, where you use your own model. Now, then like I said, it's a drag and draw experience. If you just drag your model here, it will know it's a cafe model, hence configure the rest of the options, especially this guy, because if you know about cafe framework, it produces two things. One is the model, the other one is a description file of the model, basically this put a text file. But anyhow, we infer that because it's in the same folder. Like I said, we try to do as much stuff as we can automatically for you so you don't have to bother with all these details. And uh, it will put basically the assets in this folder and it will generate such an a Java API. It's called hnetmodel.java. It's because my, my model file is named hnet. It will just basically call the Java API your file name, then model.java. Of course, we will remove all these underscores and whatnot. Then you can later directly use agentmodel.predict 
to, to, to load your model and, and, and use that to do the inference. So now I will click the RAN to start. It's a, it's a, it, we have a Docker container behind it that actually does the conversion. But like I said, we first analyze the model to see if it's compatible or not. I can show later a case why it's not compatible, what you will see. Then we do the conversion. Then we actually basically take all these results and put that into your, your project. I just want to show the details because it's kind of daunting if you would do it, do it manually because there are a lot of stuff behind the scene we put in here. These SO packages, we support both uh, the V8A and V7A architecture and also this binary, the machine code from the model here. It's all your project in these places. You can, you, you can inspect them later if you want. And uh, it's, a, it's a C++ based solution. So there will be some C++ code. Um, but we encapsulate that automatically for you with JNI. So you get this, this Java level API you can directly use. But in case you want to mess around or, or you actually want to, you want to, you know, do some more stuff on the C++ layer because it's more efficient. You can do it here. And actually, quite some code, our, our, our friend from, from, from Prisma has shown you later is actually in the C++ layer. You can also do that um, freely. So we put all these stuff in the right places. So in the end, all you have to do In your activity, here I have a main activity. All you have to do is one thing. Basically, you say at the right place here, basically. So here I'm, I'm actually loading the, if you remember, I'm actually loading the, uh, the image above. Oh, I'll just use a slide here. So I'm actually loading this image into my memory and convert that into pixels and give my API, then give it to the model to do the inference and get back the, the, the age range and, and, and probability. So I'm actually getting these pixels from that image. And before I also have some code to go to the search engine to do the searching part to find the right um, text, basically the age, and also get the image from the, from the, 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 the HTML and, and, and basically put it into my memory and convert that into pixels. And then I can use my model here, or you rather using the, the Java API here to do the prediction. So I want to predict on these pixels. So I get a result here from the from the uh, from the inference of the model. Um, the reason why there is red wiggly is because I actually did more uh, stuff in the C++ layer, but I can do that later. But just before that, now you need to actually load this model. So you have to do this basically. You use the HNet model dot load and basically load the model into the memory when you run it and you give it the, the asset manager because it needs the asset manager to, to actually find the model and load it. And then at the right place you use it to do the inference. But then just to be a responsible citizen of the the, the community, you wanna unload it. You wanna basically not to burn the memory of your user, you would actually write this line of code at undestroy of your activity here, you basically want to say HNet model dot unload to unload it from the memory. So that's using the the using the, the model part, you have to do model dot predict then the input. Here I have to fix actually uh, some small things. Um, I'm not going to go through the details here with these fixings, but uh, I actually did have some C++ code to make this work better. Because then I changed the method signature here. 
and this guy returns a string array, but I want a float array is because then I change my C++ code. Now the actually returns the flow that way. But then, those of you who know about the, the JNI encapsulations, you also have to do it here, just so that the JNI encapsulation is, is having the corresponding signature. Now this, this guy won't complain anymore. And this guy won't complain either. But then we still have the bottom part where I actually want to enhance the image. And that would be something else we can use. Because now we have just integrated our model. And that one, like I said, I want to use our APIs. We have a lot of, I think, right now should be 20 some APIs in here. So some of them are, you know, like something about the face, you can do like uh, for example, these face comparisons we can you can compare the similarity of two faces and face detection, you can find faces from images and also other stuff like like the one I told you before, here's documentation. So here's how you use it. You click an API you see that, okay, here is the documentation and here is a, a sort of image um, telling you what is the input. Here it's input is image and output is some score telling you how beautiful this image is. Then there's this um, code samples. Again, these guys you can drag and, drag and drop them. So, so basically, then I want to find this one enhances the image. It's called image super resolution, this one. I'm just going to use it directly here. So again, it's drag and drop. I need to find the right place. Basically here, I have the, actually I should have removed these code because I'm going to do it now. So I have the Im image in the memory. Now I have to do the enhancement part. So I'll just directly drag and drop this guy here. This is the part the Grido asked me if I want to download the package. I will say yes. Now I'll just hide this guy here. Now this is a couple of lines of code you have dragged and dropped here. Of course, like I said, I have to fix a few things because these are sample code. Now, this is the initialization of our API. So our, most of our APIs always have this initialization part and referencing part and the destroy part. And you might want to put them into the right places. For example, this one here, initialization, I would actually put it on top with the uncreate of my activity here. Uh, like I said, I have, should have removed them. So basically, it's this part. I'll just put it here. Then there is also this removing from the memory part, the destroy. I'll just put it on the on destroy method, like I said here. Of course, I have to fix a few things. This context looks right. And then, here's the body of API. Basically, this API just initializes itself, then it needs a bit map as input some parameters and you do the super resolution from that bitmap that's being loaded into a frame, then it returns, of course, another bitmap, which is the enhanced one. So this needed some fix, and because this is another thread, it's not the main thread, so I have to do the proper context, main activity dot this rather than this, because it's a different thread. And I have already loaded bitmap 
um, into the uh, into the memory, so I wouldn't need this. I just need that because I have already declared a bitmap and load that with the original image, and then this is the this is the return bitmap. That's enhanced one. Clearly, I want to make the naming a little bit clearer, so I do that. So now. I return them and, and show them on the UI. And uh, let's see if it compiles. There's some problem here. Never seen this one. What's this? Let me connect it a bit. Normally it's a network dies on me, but now it's something else. Config program type. Anybody knows why? Is it the import? config could be the Gradle script. These guys contradicting with one another. I'll give it one more go. This is the typical demo effect. When something works just before, it, but it's not guaranteed to work on the stage. Oh, and it completely successful. So I guess it is that thing. So now I can push that app again on my device. just to show you that it works. There's always this awkward silence while it's building and and hopefully it will end soon. Now I should show you my Screen. Now you see the app relaunches. There's some delay here. And I'll try to do the Bill Gates thing again. And it works. All right. So this is how you would code a demo. Just to recap a little bit, we have the tools, the high AI foundation tools to support you importing your own models. And then a lot of stuff happening behind the scene. But you don't have to remember everything. All you have to remember is in the end, you can call that model with one line of Java code. Of course, if you want to mess around with the C++ layer to put more efficient stuff in there, you can still do that. And uh, 
If you want to use our trained model, you can use it through our higher engine APIs, and which we also have a tool here. You can still do the drag and drop, and all the documentation is there, and it's just a couple, couple lines of code that would actually help you to leverage one of these nice models we have trained behind the scenes. So the one last thing I want to show you is the remote device. If the network is good enough here. Oh, I have to log in. Let's see. I'm tied to the Chinese version, but the one you have will be a, would be a European version. So, don't worry that if if you don't read Chinese, you won't have to take a two-year Chinese lesson to be able to use our tool. And uh, now, you see the device list. You can search here, of course. I want to just use one of these P20 devices. Hmm. Okay, yeah, I saw the search didn't work, but it worked, so we have three. If I kill this guy, we have more. Yeah, so I'll just use one of these P20s. I'll just click connect. Like I said, I, I, I didn't really have enough time to prepare the uh, you know, European version, so my version is tied to the Chinese version. So they actually right now try to connect to the lab in China. As you can see, there are some delays. Plus the network here isn't really great. But anyways, like I said, it's the Chinese lab, so it's Chinese. But the one you'll be using will be tied to the European lab and you won't have to endure yourself with all these weird characters that you don't read. Like I said, it's, it's from far away, so there's some delay here. Something is blocking this guy. Okay, now, now it's good. Then, of course, we can click all these buttons. So basically to interact with it. And I believe if I do the debugging. Uh, it's because this guy is lagging a bit. Otherwise, I would have seen like two devices. But anyhow, this would be how you use our device remotely through our tooling. In case your, 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 your dev team has more people than the amount of device you have, and all of a sudden you need to use the devices at the same time. Another thing I just want to show you briefly, which will be the last thing, it is this support we have here on the Hikey uh, devices. I, I don't have one with me today. Otherwise, if I have plugged in, we'll say connect and installing the driver for me and we'll project, the, project a virtual screen on my desktop. Um, or you can also connect that device through HDMI to another real screen. It's your choice. But we also support that in our IDE. And uh, there will be more testing services coming to Europe, and you can directly access that from our menu here. And uh, that should be everything I want to talk about today. Thank you. And uh, with that, I think we still have some time, right? If there's any questions or... Yeah, please. The first one, the second one. Yes, the first uh, round of the table with the different operators. Yes, operators. this one. Yeah. Okay. So what exactly does this compare and how does it make uh, a difference in terms of uh, sort of you know, fitness? Sort of, you know. I didn't quite get the second part clear. Can you use the mic? So you said about all these operators on the list. Yeah, how do you compare them? How, what's the, the key uh, metric to, or what's the, 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 you know, the, the, what's the 
what's it all about? What what does it compare? What 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 is it possible to you know compare these operators? I mean, like they're capable. Like you said, the um, the Apple had like 60 operators and yeah. the, the Google had 30. Yeah. And so what that is, does it say in terms of, you know, might or some power of the frameworks? Well, it's, it's, it's rather not about the power. It's just about your model because, you know, different scenarios requires different kind of, uh, you know, neural networks architectures and hence different operators to be used. For example, if you would train any sort of neural network on images, chances are you're going to have to use convolutions. I'm not going to walk you through the details of convolutions, but it, it basically does, you know, does, uh, does matrix multiplications and adding the results together. And in other cases, you would use, for example, uh, um, you know, ReLUs. These are uh, one of the must if you need an activation layer. You either you use a ReLU or 10H or, or, or if, it's, if it's binary classification, yes or no. If it's multiple class, um, classifications, if you want to tell images if it's a chair or table or, 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 or speakerphone or, or glass, you would use a softmax operators. So case being that, important being that, for different architectures, you need different operators. For different scenarios, you need different operators. So it rather depends on your scenario and your architecture. It does not necessarily say that one operator is good or better or worse than the other one. It just, in different scenarios, you use different ones. I don't know if that, that, that answers your question clearer. We have another one. So I have... Uh Maybe three questions. The, the first one is... Oh, you have three questions. Yeah, but uh, they are interrelated. I think we still have time, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, so the first question, do I have to be um, online to when I create my own model in TensorFlow, for example, do I have to be online to convert, convert this model to use it in Android Studio? Because you showed us... Uh, the conversion process. Okay. And we use echo, uh, div echo. Do I have to be online or is it uh, made offline? Yeah. So the question is, in case the rest of the guys didn't hear it clearly, so the model conversion part, does it have to be online or offline? Uh, we have two solutions. One is that the conversion is done on your, on your desktop. For this, you need actually to install Docker and Docker images, which I believe everybody knows how to do today, and everybody should have Docker engine on your device, on your desktop. So you have, you, if you have Docker, it's offline. It doesn't need any internet. Of course, you have to download the Docker image beforehand. Ah. But while you are converting, it's an entirely offline solution. And we also have the online solution, which will come, I think, next month for those guys who doesn't want to install Docker or who somehow is limited with their choices and cannot install Docker. For example, if your, 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 your laptop is managed by your, your company or you know, these enterprise managed laptops, you, are not, you don't have a lot of freedom to you know, turn on the, the, the virtualization engine to install Docker. So the answer being that there is offline version, there's the online version. Both are, 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 are free of your choice. Okay, thank you. So the next question is, maybe I will ask the, all the questions. Um, what if my model isn't uh, compatible with uh, NPU? And uh, the third question is, we have the operators for specific uh, frameworks. I can see that uh, the most uh, operators are from TensorFlow. So does it mean that uh, then I should use TensorFlow um, for preparing my models because um, there is um, more operators, so there is a greater chance that my model will be faster when I prepare it uh, in TensorFlow, not in uh, Caffeine or Android. And then. Yeah, so the second question, I just want to repeat it, is that... Um, what if the operators is not supported, right? So the third question is that, okay, there are 
clearly or apparently you know more TensorFlow operators we support here, and a little bit more than Cafe. So does that mean we endorse TensorFlow versus Cafe? So to answer your second question, which is a really good question, you know, by the way, um, if your model is not supported, because I actually forgot to demo one thing, because I only demoed you the, the positive case, as we know, in software testing, you always have to test the negative cases. Here, if I have a model that's not supported, I just want to show you how it looks like. This is a very complex model, a lot of layers. We use it for testing. By the way, this is the one I, before I, the one that, that was successful with the HNet, it was a cafe model. And here is a TensorFlow model for, for, for actually predicting hum, per, human poses, like whether you're, you know, poses like this or, or like that, basically. And if you had run this guy, we'll go through the model checking part. Will actually tell me, oh, I'm sorry, it's not, there are some things that's not supported here, some operators that's not supported here. And I can click this guy to open the report. This guy, like I said, is huge. It has 248 layers. Normally, you wouldn't train such a huge model, especially when you are running something on the, on, the, on the device. You wouldn't want a huge model, even though it's energy efficient, but still, you want to be constrained on the device rather than, you know, in the cloud. You can do, you can have a lot more computation power. And here will tell you that, okay, these are the, these are the, the operators that's not supported. And reason being the, some of them, it just, we don't support this type. Some of them is that somehow you, you use the, the you, you are out of the constraints. So once you see these kind of operators, you actually have almost always one choice left. You need to go back to, to actually um, go back to the training code to fix your model architecture. In some cases, you can replace one operator with another. Some cases, you can go work around. But that more or less means you have to retrain your model, unfortunately. And uh, that might take from somewhere to minutes to hours, hopefully not days. Depends on how, how complex your model is. But with the current solution, you, when you hit a wall like this, you have to retrain your model. But we have a, a, a actually a, a newer version, which is under development. Hopefully, it will come out pretty soon, like within a month or two, where you don't have to do this. Because for those operators we don't support on the MPU, we actually have a CPU version of that, meaning that for these layers, we support it, but the computation is going to be offloaded to CPU which means that it's going to be a little bit slower or less efficient than the NPU, but only for that particular operator or that particular layer. So if you don't have a lot of these layers or operators that's not rather compatible on the NPU, you are actually fine. For example, if you have one or two layers out of 10-ish, 20-ish, even 30-ish, basically that's fine. We just do the computation on the CPU. It's going to be a, lot, a little bit slower. So maybe like half milliseconds or, or 0 0.1, 0 0.2 milliseconds slower, but wouldn't be like one second slower. So, so that's the solution there. Now the third question, if I still remember that, is we have some, we have more operators supporting in TensorFlow and less on Cafe. Does that mean we endorse TensorFlow versus Cafe? The answer is no. It just happens so that right now, we have a little bit more operator support on TensorFlow than Cafe, but we will quickly just to, you know, to, to, to navigate around that and, and, and just have more operator supported. And you wouldn't have to see a list where Cafe is a bit less than, than TensorFlow. And you are, of course, always free to choose your own framework to train your model and, and to import your model into our framework. And we will support actually more kind of model formats. And uh, for example, CoreML, like I said, will come out from, I think, in a month. So you can basically drag and drop a CoreML model into our 
tool and we'll just convert that for you. And uh, we are eventually going to support Onyx. For those of you who don't know about Onyx, it's kind of like it's, Onyx stands for Open Net Neural Network Exchange. Basically, it's a middle format that's compatible with everybody. And hopefully, every framework will build their adapters in and out of Onyx so that eventually we can support everything and hopefully all the operators. So that's the plan there. And also, a lot of times, forgive me for like maybe one minute delay, a lot of times that's not, as, as, as app developers, we we probably cannot dictate what our AI team or data scientists do. Sometimes they are just familiar with Cafe, then, you know, more than TensorFlow, and sometimes they just want to use TensorFlow, not Cafe. So normally your AI team or your, 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 your model training team wouldn't, wouldn't be dictated by your request, and that's why we don't want to, you know, have certain endorsement to close door to one versus another, we want, to, we want to support everything within our capabilities. But of course, sometimes there are, there are just priorities. Cafe comes first or TensorFlow comes first. We might have to sacrifice a little bit and do that short term you know, pick. But in long term, we want to support everything. Uh, maybe we still have time for a couple of questions. There was someone here, right? There's one question over there. Uh, hello, I have a little question about your binaries. As far as I understand, you provide pre-compiled binaries and it cannot be compiled with another C++, for example, application. Uh, and uh, do I have opportunity to create, to compile my own binaries for your SDK? Because, for instance, I need uh, maybe a binary with Clunk or GCC. Is it possible? I don't know the answer of that question, unfortunately. But if you give me your contact information, I can relate to the right guy. OK, thank you. Yeah, because I don't know a lot about Unity. And, and don't, I don't want to you know, speculate here. I'm sorry for that. But I'll come to you later. Thank you. Yeah. So maybe we have time for the last question. If you still want, go. Hey, so. Um, I have several questions. I'm not sure if we have uh, time for all of them. I might have uh, asked this yesterday as well. Does, does your API work on um, any NPU power device or only Huawei NPU power devices? Um, the answer is, at the moment, it works only on Huawei and few devices. Okay. Because you know we are still at a very early stage of the neural processors on the device, especially. So there isn't an industry standard there to guide everybody. So right now we are doing our own implementation. I don't think any other device makers are doing it yet, but they will do it. Just a matter of time, I believe. A lot of guys will follow within this year or next year. But their solution might be, a, for example, like Qualcomm, they have a GPU plus DSP um, you know, solution rather than just an MPU, uh, which is, if you ask me, less efficient and inferior, but that's their choice. So short answer being that it will only run on our devices. But we are working on a solution so that you can code your app once and it runs differently on our device and non-Huawei device. So you don't have to code two apps. It's just one app that runs on all devices. But when it's Huawei device, it just happens so that it, it's much more efficient. It does the computation much faster. So you will have a much better user experience. And on other devices, you might have to face the choice of either you know, let your user bearing the slowness or, or less performance app or just maybe don't provide that capability on other devices, have some sort of smooth transition out of that capability. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks.